Today is August 17th, 2021. The Lawrence Board of Zoning Appeals is called to order at this time. I need a motion and a second for the approval of the minutes from July 20th, 2021. So moved. Second. All those in favor have approved the minutes. One question before we vote. Yes, sir. Uh, in the fourth line, you said that uh, you announced we had a quorum, but you also announced that we did not have five members. I think that should be in the, the I minute. can add that. If, if I add that, are you okay with the signature? Okay. Yeah, but I think that turned out to be an important part of the meeting. So. Okay. Not a problem. With the correction that Mr. Crouch um, presented, do I have a um, motion and a second for the approval with the correction? Yes. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, nay. Okay, minutes have been um, passed. If you've not done so, please sign in at the back of the room and anyone wishing to speak tonight, please stand and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Answer, answer with I do. Thank you. We do have a quorum present tonight. We have one member via Zoom. That means that our alternate member, Amber Denny, will not be voting tonight, just f for the record. Do we have any special requests tonight, continuance, withdrawals, or waivers? We did receive a request to withdraw petition 21 LUV 07 5505 North Post Road. Okay, thank you very much. We'll per proceed with old business. 21 LSV-056002 Sunnyside Road of develop of a uh, variance of development standards of the following section of the City of Indianapolis Consolidated Zoning Subdivision Ordinance in order to facilitate occupy of a portion of the existing facility by a distributor of lumber type products. Um, the first one is outside storage in excess of 25% of the building within 500 feet of a protected district without complete wraparound screening fence and in excess of height of fence. The second one is 12 foot tall fence in front and side yard uh, proposed, three and one and a half feet permitted in front yard and 10 feet permitted in side and rear yard. Thank you. State your name. Thank you and good evening, uh, board members, Chairperson Lytle, Joe Calderon, 11 South Meridian, Indianapolis, Indiana. Um, this is the third time that we've been in front of you concerning this case, so I'm not sure if uh, the board members need us to kind of run through the whole thing again or whether we just want to kind of pick up with the information that we have tendered since the last board meeting. I think yes, we were sir. all present, but Mr. West and Desmond, Desmond last, and last month. Do you have any questions or? So we've got a whole PowerPoint, which I can load up if, you know, if you weren't here. I'm, I wasn't here actually for the June meeting, so I wasn't sure who was here and saw it for the first time. So why don't we refresh our memory? Okay. Will this go in here, Renee? It should, yes. So this property for the benefit of the uh, board members is a existing industrially zoned property. The issue has been, I think, because it has been used until the pandemic hit as kind of a sports recreation facility at Crediplex uh, for a number of years. Prior to that, it was industrial. It remained zoned industrial. 
and now we have an industrial use that proposes to go in. So we're not really talking about a variance of use. What we're talking about is the chairperson um, recited our development standard variances, chiefly to facilitate uh, outside storage in excess of 25% uh, of the building size. We actually have eliminated the need for one variance, and that is we do have complete wraparound fencing now. Um, so it doesn't matter that she read it on the record, but it, it's uh, we have taken care of that. Um, Which one? So the tenant so this one, right? uh, for this property is U.S. Lumber, and they are not a lumber yard. They are really a distributor of products. Um, we do have U.S. Lumber uh, representatives uh, here to answer questions. So we kind of went through the U.S. Lumber uh, values last time. They already have a presence here in Indianapolis. Uh, they are relocating to this site, um, and we think that the city uh, administration is excited about that. Uh, this kind of describes what U.S. Uh, lumber does. Uh, they have kind of an eastern half of the country presence, uh, and this describes what happens on a daily basis. So they'll get material, they'll pull it, load it, and get it ready to go out to the next day to their customers. Uh, they do uh, uh, fiber cement siding, composite deck and railing, exterior trim and engineered lumber. They don't saw raw lumber and uh, they're not like 84 lumber in other words. So they've grown uh, to be on a uh, scale, uh, the second largest private distributor in North America. Uh, they've done it uh, through uh, acquisitions uh, across the uh, country, the eastern half again. Uh, so they are doing things correctly uh, and right, and they have relationships with uh, lots of, uh, of their customers here in the Indianapolis area to date. You can see kind of their footprint uh, here. Um, the fact that they are large doesn't mean that this is going to be a gigantic operation, but what it does mean, I think, is that they have the financial wherewithal uh, to operate uh, successfully at this location and to, um, of course, keep their uh, obligations that they will owe to the, to the landlord. You know, the landlord, uh, current owner, um, made a tough decision to discontinue the uh, indoor recreation space. And it's despite the fact that you have uh, a lot of industrial building going on, a lot of that is bulk distribution. Uh, this facility is not quite big enough for that kind of tenant, so you have to get a little more of a specialty tenant uh, to, to locate in, in a building uh, of this size. This is kind of the regional uh, size and scope. Overall, not for this, not for this building. Sorry, just lined up. So some of the things we talked about last time that were important to the board were, okay, what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and how do we get comfortable knowing that uh, this site in the surrounding infrastructure can handle it. So they are going to operate with approximately 25 uh, employees, uh, two shifts, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. total. Uh, what became a, a topic of conversation were the inbound and outbound large trucks, tractor trailers. Uh, we would forecast eight out early, early in the morning, eight in during the major part of the morning between 7 a.m. and noon. Keep in mind that with industrial two zoning, 
if we weren't really talking about the outside storage, they could pop in a bunch of, of uh, drive-in doors and docks, and we wouldn't be here in front of you talking about uh, truck traffic or the number of trucks. But we have to get a variance, so we are. So that'll kind of give you the idea. Eight or 16 total in and out within uh, several hours is a pretty small amount of large truck traffic nor do they have a significant amount of in and out customer traffic. You can see about a half a dozen. This is kind of what their existing operations and other facilities look like. Everything's neatly stacked, not super tall. You can see it's within a fenced yard against the building. It's organized for efficient loading uh, to get the material out to their customers, and that's what you could expect in this uh, instance. We will have fence height uh, all the way around. We're very fortunate uh, in this particular uh, case to have uh, to the west a significant existing wooded area and space between the railroad tracks uh, and uh, the building uh, before you get to any residences. So we have uh, a lot of natural screening and distance between us and residential areas to the north-northwest. That kind of gives you an idea of how they load up certain types of trucks, what they do on the inside. This is the site plan that we're talking about, uh, which uh, shows that the bulk of the storage activity is going to be wrapped around uh, on the south and back to the east, uh, wrapping around. There is kind of the loading area for outbound trucks that uh, is proposed to be in that front part, part of the building uh, or front part of the property uh, just to the east of the building, but even that is still uh, significantly distant from uh, Sunnyside Road, uh, well over 100 feet. Plus, we are going to add a couple of things to help screen that. We'll have a 10-foot fence, a 2-foot berm, and landscaping uh, added uh, in front of that area. You can see the, the decorative fencing uh, in the light blue, so it's not going to be chain link in front. It'll be kind of the aluminum wrought iron style. Uh, and again, it'll be, the product will all be behind that uh, with landscaping in front and berm. So you really won't, the streetscape won't change other than you'll see a screening fence in, in landscaping now. Question, is that referring to the outside storage? Excess of 25, is that, that's number one on there? 25% of the building. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For, some reason um, our zoning ordinance uh, relates, even though it contemplates this type of use and other distribution type of uses as a percentage of the building size for outside storage. That's real chiefly the, the reason. So, I mean, if we had a million square foot building, not a problem, but we, we don't have that. Um, scenario in, in this uh, particular case. So the variance is technically in excess of 25% of the building. Uh, wrapping around, uh, we will have um, a, a fence of eight feet in height that wraps around uh, the entire perimeter of the building. So everything we think uh, will satisfy the initial concerns about making sure that uh, people uh, won't have access to product for either safety reasons or mischief, um, mischievous reasons. Uh, so we think that we've uh, addressed those uh, issues uh, as well. We've added the decorative fence um, coming back uh, to the west uh, to provide a little uh, relief um, against the, the Meyer uh, plastics facility to the south, and we have had conversations with, with Ralph Meyer uh, in that regard. So 
that in essence is what you would be looking at, at least from a bird's eye view, and you saw the other, the other pictures. So last time there were questions that came up regarding, uh, well, how do you manage traffic vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, school bus traffic? And we went to the MSD of Lawrence Township and I tendered um, a letter that I received from them to the board. I hope you all have that. Thank you. Letter from Roger Smith uh, that talks about uh, their recognition of this use and they do not see a conflict and it'll even resolve itself further uh, once the new transportation center uh, opens uh, at the beginning of next year. The other thing that uh, was discussed at length last time, and we've done this via commitment, is to make sure that we manage the operation uh, to the best of our ability to avoid conflicts and backups um, on Sunnyside Road. So what we've put in is uh, a promise, and you should all have this commitment as well. Do, do you have that? Yes, I do. Okay. Uh, that really encourages uh, the tenant to talk to its uh, drivers and uh, drivers that drop off product to come in uh, from the south side and then uh, exit uh, from the north side. Will it be 100%? Probably not, but they will encourage that. And really, frankly, once drivers get used to that kind of pattern, it becomes uh, a lot easier. So uh, we will have uh, additional signage uh, encouraging and showing entry and exit. And we've made that as a promise to this board, which we think uh, should satisfy any, any concerns. Again, this goes above and beyond kind of the scope of the variance because it's not really related to outside storage, but it does relate to the user that's asking for the variance. So we want to make sure that, that this board is comfortable that the operation will um, run smoothly and, and not um, constitute any sort of uh, health or safety issue for, uh, for the city. Um, so uh, those are the additional items that we brought with us uh, to the table tonight. Um, we do have representatives of U.S. Lumber here to answer questions. We got representatives <laughs> of the ownership group. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, we've tended our findings of fact. Uh, we hope you uh, feel comfortable adopting those and that you can approve our variance tonight. Uh, with that, I'll conclude and answer any questions or refer questions to the other representatives and thank you again for your time tonight any questions at this time no thank you thank you we'll hear from any remonstrators that are for or against the petition is there anyone here Council Rick Wells. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Rick Wells, uh, Councilman District 2. And uh, the attorney, I think, answered my question. I was hoping to see uh, maybe something from the uh, school district on the uh, traffic impact. Uh, did not receive that, but. Yeah, we did. Did you guys get it? Yeah, we got it. We got it. Yeah. Okay. I, apparently, I must have missed it. But that was really my big concern. And apparently that's all been answered. I don't want to particularly, you know, say that I'm totally speaking for the council, but seeing how there's no one here tonight, I think, uh, and from what my understanding is, I think everything's been answered and I think the concerns are no longer. So um, uh, I appreciate the attorney and his diligence in putting up with all of our questions and, and also with this board putting up with all of our questions and concerns. Um, did want to, if when he comes back up to clarification on his hours uh, and if it's going to change any. But uh, beyond that, uh, I think uh, we're all good with it. But once again, I appreciate you all putting up with us and your patience. Thank you. Anybody else? 
We will hear then from the city of Lawrence. Renee? Okay. Oh, or is Dan oh, coming out? Dan? We'll let Dan do it. That seems to be a common phrase around here. Let Dan and Sri do it. <laughs> uh, good evening. Appreciate this board very much. I appreciate all the input that's gone on, all the questions that have been been asked throughout this process. I also appreciate the very the patience of the petitioner. Uh, they have clients and business backed up now because we have continued this. But I understand it's uh, important for everybody to get comfortable with it. Uh, from an economic development standpoint, the city, I can't think of a better tenant. We have one that's not really going to create dust, not going to create noise, not going to work 24 hours a day. Uh, if you all remember, this was a steel plant before. There's nothing we could do to prevent a steel plant from going back in there the way it's zoned. There's nothing we could do to present, prevent a thousand trucks a day. Um, I also would like to remind this board that a big part of the variances requested are because I imposed on them. Uh, we imposed the fencing, we imposed the landscaping, we imposed all those things to be sure that this project is in the interest of the city. So if they hadn't had to have the 25% storage requirement, they wouldn't even have had to clean up the front of it. So. I think it's really in the best interest of the city. I know everybody wants to do what's right. I ask that uh, you strongly consider approving this, and thank you very much. Any board, any member have questions for the city of Lawrence? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Dan, just one thing. The city of Lawrence brought the steel company in, so. Yeah, that's right. I, it was you a much part. heavier use, but uh, we didn't sit around idly. Then. Right, and, uh, and this, uh, Everybody, one of, one of the really hard things that I've learned is pulling at everybody's heartstrings is how much they loved Incrediplex. They just loved it. Their families loved it, they have good memories of it, but it's not coming back. And, and this, to me, this is the very best possible outcome we could have for this particular facility with the kind of tenant we have to keep it clean, keep it neat, and not negatively impact the neighborhood. So thank you. Thank you. Petitioner? Nothing really to rebut. We're just grateful to uh, have been able to uh, get the additional information and supply it to uh, the board in a timely manner, and hopefully that uh, makes everyone comfortable and we can break that 2-2 two -two tie vote. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. The board ready to vote? Are any questions at this time? Ready to vote? The board will be voting on 21 LSV 05 6002 Sunnyside Road, a variance of development standard of the following sections of the City of Indianapolis Consolidated Zoning Subdivision Ordinance in order to facilitate occupancy of a portion of the existing facility a distributor of lumber type products. Outside storage in excess of 25% of the building within 500 feet of a protected district and 12 foot tall fence in front and side yard proposed three and one half uh, feet permitted in front yard and 10 feet permitted in side and rear yard. And we will have uh, voting with the commitments that were submitted in the file. Desmond, because you're virtual, I'll have to take a roll call vote from you. Would you please state A or nay? Yay. Thank you. We have a unanimous vote to pass the petition. Thank you very much. Thank you. The board will hear our Joe. second. Will you do me a favor and take that off? Thank you. I appreciate it. The board will hear the second uh, piece of old business, 21 LUV-08-12024 East 65th Street. Variance of use of table 743-1 to allow motor vehicle sales not permitted. Who is here for the petition? Me again. Joe Calder and 11 South Meridian. Hello, you again. <laughs> <laughs> 11 South Meridian, Indianapolis. Um, also with us tonight is Sean Miller, the owner of the property and the uh, petitioner, uh, and he is happy to answer any questions. So this is an interesting uh, case from a, a lot of perspectives. We might not think of this little street, 12024 East 65th Street, just uh, tucked a little behind uh, Pendleton Pike as being a commercial area, but 
in fact, the property is zoned commercial. So each of you should have an exhibit book, which I will walk you through. Um, does everybody have one of these? Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So the first one, uh, I, I'd like you to just uh, go to tab two, which shows uh, kind of the zoning map for this area. And 12024 is the darker shaded property, kind of right in the middle of the map there. And you can see that not only it, but the other properties uh, that are on the south and west quadrants of Brandon and Broadway, north of 65th, they're all zoned C3 commercial. Uh, and property across the street, um, there was some C1 zoning, some other C3 zoning, and then a subdivision um, directly across the street to the south that's D5-2 and some D5 that's across uh, Brandon Street. So it, the reason we're asking for a variance of use is this. C3 commercial, you think retail, restaurant, um, that type of, of indoor use. And I know that the advertisement and the application says uh, for car sales in a C3. This is not car sales as in car lots or open area, but the zoning ordinance only knows one thing, and that is to put car sales in C5 which is a large outdoor zoning district. This operation is not outdoors oriented in any way, shape, or form. And when we filed the petition and when Sean talked to the city about locating his business here, uh, it was explicitly understood that this is not to be an outdoor car lot and not to be a business that's open for the general public. In other words, I can't go there, you can't go there. This is essentially a classic car, high-end, internet, phone-based operation that occasionally will have a car that's brought there and stored. He doesn't buy cars and then sell them. A lot of this is just brokering, finding the right buyer and marrying them up and facilitating the transaction. He's done this for a long time. Mr. Miller is a car enthusiast himself and has a large personal collection of vehicles, which ironically he's had at this property for his own use because he owns the property. Uh, and nobody can say or do anything about that. This will not really change that dynamic uh, at all. So yes, we are asking for a variance to allow car sales, but not in the truest sense. If you look at tab five, that's the plan of operation that we have put in uh, to the record. We filed this when we filed the application and it talks exactly about what happens and what will happen day to day with this business. The neat thing is, is, and we didn't really talk about this in the plan of operation so much, but Mr. Miller happens to be a historic preservationist. He's been involved in restoring historic properties uh, in and around downtown Indy. This particular property has a historic home on it, or at least an old one. It's over 100 years old. His idea is that he and his wife uh, will restore, live there, and he'll just operate his business there from his dining room, essentially. Will a customer, will he uh, take a car to a customer from this property? Will a classic car be dropped off? Yes, and you can kind of see when this might happen and how many times it might happen. The point of that is, is that the frequency and the use will be less intense than many C3 uses that can go in and use this property, pull permits from Renee's department and people can't say anything. Pharmacy, tavern, other retail, Dollar General, 
all kinds of things with no restrictions, no plan of operation, can go in there as a matter of right. That would not be a good thing because that house is special to Mr. Miller and he wants to, to retain it. So we put in the plan of operation to make sure that the board understands specifically exactly what's going to happen. And we've tied that plan of operation to commitments, which we also tendered as part of our application. This is not something that we negotiated after the fact. This is something that we put in when we filed. And the commitments are set forth in tab six. First commitment is that the variance shall be subject to the plan of operation filed with the city of Lawrence on June 16th, 2021, i.e. tab five. Second variance is that this variance can only be used by Mr. Miller or an entity owned or controlled by him, which currently is Significant Cars, Inc. This variance will not run with the land. So we've put that in as a commitment. That was certainly a concern that the city raised. Mr. Miller had, had talked with the city uh, before uh, contacting me to file this variance for him. So we put in the commitment that ties the plan of operation uh, and keeps it to be a personal uh, type variance. Uh, you can see in tab three photos of the existing house it is uh, painted yellow and the barn in the back where uh, he will be facilitating. He already stores uh, some of his own vehicles there. That's not going to change. Tab four is a proposed uh, site plan where a new lower barn type structure could be constructed. That's not in play for tonight because we haven't gotten an accurate survey of the property to locate it, but we wanted to be transparent that there uh, could be an additional structure, and this is was sent out with our notices back uh, at the beginning of July uh, to house additional vehicles uh, as part of this operation. Again, it would be low and kind of married to the existing uh, farmhouse uh, style architecture uh, on this property. If you are curious about specifically what type of vehicles that are being brokered, sold, dealt, just turn to tab seven and you can see some photos of the types of vehicles that he deals with. He would be crazy to store these outside. It wouldn't be safe and they won't be. Uh, so you can see that these are rarities, uh, specialized cars, it's really a neat niche. The type of clientele that Mr. Miller deals with are the type of clientele that you might want to have visit Lawrence and experience some of the other amenities, the parks and the restaurants and whatnot as they uh, come to do business with Mr. Miller. Again, this is very infrequent. It's a few times per month. So this is the type of vehicle that he deals with, and these are the kind of vehicles that we actually had on display for some of the neighbors that we invited over for a meeting a couple of weeks ago at Council Rusomarov's uh, uh, request. Uh, only three households took advantage of that, but he had just some beautiful cars out to just kind of emphasize the point that this is not a car lot. This is not a runaway train. Finally, uh, if you don't believe us, uh, we have gone out, and, and Mr. Miller deserves the credit, he's gone out to talk to a number of his neighbors, and he's gotten uh, more than 25 of them <clears throat> to uh, execute a petition supporting uh, this variance. You can find these uh, signatures in tab seven. I'm sorry, tab eight. My apologies, tab eight. Including really all of his surrounding uh, property owners. 6521 Brandon Street was uh, mistyped in. Um, it was signed by Mr. Whiteside, and he said uh, he wrote his address at 6511. So essentially, we have all the adjoining property owners 
that have been advised of this and that support this petition. You can see the mapping with the stars indicated of folks that signed. There are some others that go um, uh, farther south on uh, 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 Tishiana Drive, and you can see I tried to work with the beacon maps to star them, but they did, I didn't save them very well, and those are the other two maps. But a significant majority of his neighbors are aware of this. They support Mr. Miller's endeavors. They want to see that home preserved. They're absolutely understanding that nothing from what they've witnessed is really going to change. He's not operating his business now, but he does have his personal car collection. Uh, there, by the way, nothing is really going to change precipitously from that, and that they're very supportive of, of that. And we hope that you think that that's important, and it should be, because one of the findings that we have to make is that what we're asking for does not adversely affect the use or value of our adjoining neighbors. And with those folks signing off, we think we've satisfied that. This does not generate traffic. It, of any significant proportion, much less than a typical C3. We think that meets the finding that this will not adversely affect the health, safety, and welfare. We do think the ordinance has a quirk uh, to it because it's kind of a one-size-fits-all for vehicle sales. They don't contemplate indoor vehicle sales, but it does happen. And personally, I've been involved in getting variances for Tesla when they went into the mall at Keystone at the Crossing. Same exact thing. Indoor retail, C5 is required, got a variance, not a problem. You know, they had operated there for uh, a number of years without any um, complaints uh, whatsoever. And we expect that this will even be less because this is not a showroom that's open to, pub, to the public. Uh, the final tab relates to Eric Rowland's letter uh, to this board. Eric uh, has been involved in kind of designing the site uh, and his personal feelings about trying to respect the uh, existing farmhouse look. Uh, you know, we've got the existing barn that's being used in the secondary uh, barn would be um, uh, consistent with that in terms of uh, design technique and, and height. And with that, uh, we hope that uh, our efforts, and, and particularly Mr. Miller's efforts, to uh, have this uh, variance brought to his neighbors and their support and have this business be part of a commercial zone, even though it has a residential structure on it, uh, is something that this board can support. City supports it, his neighbors support it. We think we meet um, our required findings and we hope that you do as well. We're happy to answer any questions. Sean, did you uh, add anything? Are you good? I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, you yeah. I do have a question. Of course. You were here last week and we approved a almost twin to this request last a, month yeah uh, a internet internet based seller of classic cars but there were some commitments made to us yeah no advertising no balloons on uh, so that can we get a commitment like that it seems to me from what you're sure. saying you yeah. had never you would you'd never put a uh, Variable yeah. message sign right. out front saying, no, no, no. "Yeah, no, we're going to have very discreet signage, um, and that's it. Just a couple of discreet." What signs. is discreet signing? Um, we're going to fence the entire area, which Joe uh, neglected to mention. So the whole property will be fully screened from its neighbors. Uh, six foot fence around most of the back of the property, and then um, in one, there were I was planning on two signs um, that they of course have to be approved by the city before they're installed at the corner of the property at Brandon Street there's a little kind of notch off the fence where it doesn't go all the way to the edge of the to the point there so I figured there'd be a small discreet wooden sign on that fence with just the company name and then and what's the company significant significant cars is the okay. name of the company 
And it then, would be a, not a electronic sign. No, no, no. Wooden sign, sign painted logo. In the period logo. of the... Uh, That's it, okay. And then uh, another hanging sign because initially until the other barn is built and we build this other driveway, the main entrance is uh, this alley here to the west. So I was figuring a small wooden hanging sign from one of the Pence posts, very professional, very historic looking and discreet with maybe one of those old fashioned pointer hands, you know, kind of saying this way, but not very big, this big, you know, small. And again, these will have to be approved. But yeah, there's not going to be any dancing balloon guys. No, no really? balloons, okay. no need. And you'll put that in writing, no, right? Oh, sir. Yeah, yeah. We'll put that in writing. Yeah, sir. Okay, one other question. You mentioned using a carport. That, it, that seems to me that's outside storage. Tell me why the carport is a part of um, the state, your business plan. Okay, it, well, the state requires that I have 10 parking spaces in order to be a licensed car dealer. You only have to have a uh, 100 square foot building, which is nothing like 10 by 10, and uh, you have to have a desk and a file cabinet and a phone, and you have to have 10 spaces. The barn will hold, the existing barn holds eight cars. So the two-car carport is there strictly to qualify the number of spaces. I don't plan on storing a Packard out there in the carport. So could, yeah, I suppose if you make a commitment, you're violating the state Right, you have to have the spaces available. You don't have to use them. I've been up in Fortville for the last six years in what was essentially an old Texaco station from the 50s. And it only had two indoor spots. And there were some outdoor spots. But I never had more than a handful of more modern cars, like, you know, like a 72 uh, Camaro or something out there, and typically not for very long. Um, even though I had plenty of space to put 10 cars out there, I, I just don't like leaving these cars outside. Uh, most of the cars I deal with are very high-end pre-war cars. That muscle car is kind of that, you, that he picked as an image I wish he hadn't picked. That's <laughs> sort of a rarity for me. I primarily deal in Auburns, Packards, Cords, Duesenbergs, very expensive cars built before World War II that have wooden framed bodies. Most people don't know this, but like a Duesenberg is a, actually cars descended from carriages. So early cars were basically just a motorized carriage. So they still had a carriage built body effectively, a wooden frame with metal, typically aluminum, over the wood. Um, so we, we don't leave these cars. We, they almost never get taken out even in the rain. I mean we're very overprotective. And you won't rebuild them there? Nope, I have a separate facility downtown and I'm not a restorer, I'm a, I'm a retailer. I don't, I don't really like to have to work on the cars. And 80% of my business, I don't even touch the car. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an international business, I have an international clientele and 80% of my business is selling, like one of the cars pictured is a Duesenberg. Okay, we sold that car in July, or no, it was May, and it was in Texas. It never left Texas, uh, and it went to California. It never came to Indiana. I, I, I don't really need a dealer's license for 80% of what I do because it doesn't really involve the state of Indiana, but I do occasionally buy a car out of an estate or have to deal with a car from somebody that can't deal with showing the car. Um, and so I do enjoy having my dealer's license, uh, but I'm a very, I mean, I, uh, I sell about 30 cars a year that I have bought and resold. So that's free a month. So how long have you owned this property? About seven years. Okay. You've, <laughs> okay. And you said you currently have in Fortville this business? Yeah, I'm, Texaco? I'm moving it. I, I need to move it from okay. Fortville to my lease is up. I'm out of that structure. Okay. So. Regarding the fencing uh, you mentioned, what, what would that look like? Wooden dog-eared fencing uh, around the back. 
I don't know if we finalized the design for the front, but it'll be a custom made picket fence. My concern is with the same as Tom's of um, no repairs on the cars. Certainly. You know, yeah. um, signs. We don't want electronic signs there into a neighborhood. Um, and I don't want it to become a car lot, <laughs> you know, where you have cars outside. Yeah, well, um, I have a little bit of concern about maybe building the bigger barn, but right now we're looking at the variance that's in front of us because that's not in front of us. Um, so there those are my barn. concerns at this time. Sorry. I'm sorry. Go right, on. that's not part of this variance. I'm just saying that's kind of a concern of mine. But right now mine is no repairs on cars, like Tom said, um, all these flashy type things. Uh, we're in a residential area and I'm very, very protective of a residential area. So that's where my concerns are. And I don't know where the board has any other questions or. Well, actually I do have a question about the barn. In tab four, it shows it separate from the existing barn. In the letter from Mr. Rowland, it says it would replace the barn structure. I'm sorry, could you repeat what you said, Mr. Hall? The, on the letter from Mr. Rowland, mm -hmm. it says um, the storage building for collective, collectible historic vehicles simply replaces the barn structure. The, in the location, if you look at tab four, where it says proposed pole barn, mm -hmm. there was a structure there, historically speaking. It's no longer there. There was one there on time. The existing barn will remain because it's really kind of a neat, beautiful barn that was used for lots of different things historically. So uh, the second barn that's not there today does replace one that was there years ago. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt earlier, but I wanted to point that out, that we're yeah. not putting something somewhere it wasn't. There was a historic barn on this property in that very location. So we've been careful to respect the history of the property. I'm a historic preservationist. I fixed up six Victorian houses and five Victorian buildings. And it's one of, I'm passionate about two things, old houses and old cars. And so um, I'm trying to do the best I can to preserve this property. And you and your wife are planning on staying here Correct. I'm sorry. You're planning on staying there and not really changing that house into a right. I'm 62. This is where I'm going to I mean, we my wife and I love this property. Our intention has always been to move here. And my intention was always to build a car barn. And then when um, she decided to sell the building in Fortville, I started looking at other options and I contacted the city and they were supportive of it as with all these mm -hmm. restrictions. Right. And so I thought, well, this would be great. Then I don't have to go lease another property um, and that I fully plan to retire to this property and, and I'm not, uh, I think uh, Councilor Rusimov when she came to the meeting was concerned about the number of employees and I hadn't even thought about hiring more people. I mean, if I do, like I told her, or it'll probably be in a different marketplace like, you know, Florida or California and uh, versus building a team of people here. I'm, I'm approaching retirement. I'm not, not looking to. But I think that's where the world's going business. anymore is Viva Internet doing all this yeah. stuff. So I don't think, yeah, I think traffic to a, a sense is not there. Okay, understand. Any other questions at this time? Okay, okay. Thank, thank you. you. We will now hear for anyone for or against the petition. Good evening, Board of Zoning Appeals. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you for your service to the Lawrence commu community. My name is Maria Rosamaroff. My address is 11754 Sinclair Drive, and I am a City of Lawrence Councilor representing the 4th District. I am here regarding Petition 2021 LUV-008, located at 12024 East 
65th Street, which is in my council district. I am here representing my constituents who asked me to remonstrate on their behalf, and I have submitted some exhibits that you might peruse while I'm speaking on some of these subjects. The property at 12024 East 65th Street is a beautiful tree-lined property and home and was developed as a home site, has been used as a home site for many, many years. The sales of vehicles is permitted within a C5 district, a district which is characterized by major repairs of vehicles, sales, outdoor commercial amusement and recreational uses, or by activities or operations conducted in buildings not completely enclosed. This district tends to be for outdoor functions, brightly lit and noisy. C5 uses should be located on selected, heavy, commercial thoroughfares, not small neighborhood streets and alleys, and should avoid locating adjust adjacent to protected districts i.e. residential uses according to the zoning ordinance. Auto sales is a permitted use in a C5 district, as you know, not in a C4 and not in a C3 district, and therefore obviously the reason for this request. The property is and was zoned C3 many years ago, which allows for small neighborhood commercial uses, but it was developed and used as a home for many years. The comprehensive plan recommends village mixed use for this site, defined as mixed use topologies having a balance of places where people live and places where people work that are compatible with residential uses. This topology is historically small town centers, which is precisely this area. The topology is designed to serve the adjacent neighborhood rather than the wider community. So compact, walkable, on a pedestrian scale. These uses can be mixed vertically in the same building, so a small business on the first floor and a home on the second floor, but not a C5 auto use. Does Lawrence need another auto sales business? By my last count, the city of Lawrence has over 23 auto sales businesses. That is one auto sales dealership for every 2,300 persons in Lawrence. Although the request states it will operate by appointment, who will enforce that? Currently, the site has a large barn and a carport which can ha house 10 autos. And the petitioner was asked if he would agree to a compromise and limit this vi vi variance to the existing 10 sites, even though the carport is not enclosed and would be outdoor storage, which in the plan of operation stated there would be no outside storage or display. When asked if the petitioner would agree to a variance of use to only the 10 sp spaces, he responded, no. He will build a 100 by 50 foot warehouse to hold approximately 30 vehicles. When asked if he could cut the building in half in size, he quoted, no, that is a deal breaker. He requires the additional building. A building of that size is a warehouse not permitted in a C3 or a C5, but in an industrial district. So the character of this site goes from a quaint residential farm-like homestead to an industrial site with an industrial warehouse. When asked when the petitioner would be living at the site, he said, oh, in a year and a half or so. And when I ask about the address at 626 Park Avenue as listed on the property card, he in indicated that was one of his properties, but he lives in Geist. The petitioner indicated there would be no more than one to three employees. When I was trying to ascertain and understand if additional employee traffic and parking would be occurring, the petitioner stated those employees will be doing sales appointments and calls and using the home as an office. But when asked, given the COVID experience, couldn't these appointments and computer sales be done virtually from their own homes? 
the petitioner stated, well, they will be doing detailing and other vehicle needs. Hmm. So actually, the employees will not be off of sales, they will be working on the vehicles. Again, an expansion of the variance of use to vehicle maintenance, could oil and vehicle li liquids be released? Maybe auto repairs? The petitioner has committed to a plan of operation and commitments, but who, who will be ensuring that these commitments are adhered to? Is there a zoning inspector available to check on that on a periodic basis? If this petition is granted, it will erode the residential character of this site by allowing large vehicle trailers coming and going at least 20 times per month and potential for customer trailers picking up vehicles could be up to 10 per month. This means a trailer with vehicles to be dropped off and picked up could be close to one per day. The streets that the trailers will be transporting vehicles can barely allow two small vehicles to pass along Brandon Street. The alley on the west side of the property is even smaller. I did not want to drive my small compact car down it, but vehicle trailers will be traversing for vehicle drop-offs? Hmm. Also, the petitioner stated he would be conducting customer pickups from another property, not his own. Obviously, this property is not capable of conducting this type of business use as required. Now, additionally, adding a six-foot fence all around the property will also erode, erode the character, residential character of this neighborhood and signage will also erode that residential character. The perception of this site is as a quaint little neighborhood will be removed once this oversized warehouse is built and this industrial use begins. The storage and warehouse of vehicles is, according to the zoning ordinance, industrial use. The size, bulk, and height are all determinants in what cons constitutes an industrial use versus a commercial use. The site was zoned for C as C3 years ago, expecting at some future date the small center town influences for small neighborhood retail uses would have some marketability. However, the marketability of that location at this time is not supportable. No major C3 type of retail use, such as a Dollar General store, would locate at this site at this time. The streets do not have the capacity, nor the traffic patterns, nor the intensity for drive through traffic. Even the small grooming business two doors down is out of business because it is not a good area for commercial uses. However, being on the quarter of Pendleton Pike, a major thoroughfare and a state highway, is in a much different situation than being tucked into a wooded neighborhood home site. The request is far too intense for this site. Even a neighborhood retail outlet, outlet would not work because the traffic patterns is just not correct. The site is miszoned as C3 and should be rezoned to residential. Allowing this type of development on this site will be a disservice to the surrounding community, it will erode the residential character of this area, and it will lower the property values of the existing properties in their homes. I ask you please vote to deny this request, and I thank you for your time. Councilor, I got a question for you. Yes, it says here that the City of Lawrence is recommending approval but mm -hmm. it says before they could build that big warehouse, as you called it, um, it would have to get a, a variance from us. If they did not have that warehouse, would you still be against the petition? Yes, ma'am. I okay. offered that as a compromise, but Mr. Miller pointedly and aggressively said, no, that is a deal breaker. Those are quotes. I went and had a meeting with the neighborhood and himself on a fact-finding mission because I was on the fence about this particular site. And I was trying to get information so I could understand how this would operate. But 
it was very obvious to me that this is going to become a storage warehouse for vehicles. And I personally believe that that will erode the residential character, even though it's zone C3, there are some other areas in that particular vicinity that are miszoned. There's an SU1, just a couple, a street down, that has many homes, and it's zoned for church use, religious uses. So obviously, there's a lot of miszoning in that particular area because it was zoned many years ago. It did not develop that way, and it's not in the path of that t sort of development currently. Now, maybe in 20 more years, we may see some changes, but certainly by putting an industrial type use at this location with that huge warehouse, I think it's gonna be a detriment to our community. And if they would compromise and only allow the 10 sites for vehicle storage as is required by his vehicle license, and I understand that licensure because I used to give those out. So I do understand what he's in need of. And I don't think the community would be and myself would not be opposed to that. That's fine, use the existing barn as it is, even allow for the couple spaces with the carports, all understandable. I would like him to live there. If he has a couple employees come in or out from time to time, that would be fine. But I really believe building this huge warehouse is his intent and it is not to live there. It is not to have, uh, maybe there's internet sales that will, will occur, but I don't believe that's the premise of this request. And once you open it up, it's really hard to pull it back. That's all. Are there neighbors here that, okay. We all do that. And where do you live proximately to this? Three houses away. I live, what, three houses yeah. to the west. Okay, we need your name and your address for the record. Please. My name is Gene Harner, 11940 East 65th Street, Indianapolis, okay. Indiana. You're right on the corner there when you, you can go this. A little triangle. Yeah, 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 right. a little triangle, right. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> We've, we've been there 58 years, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of young kids across the street mm -hmm. right next to us. Brandon is one skinny little road. Mm -hmm. Now, he's talking about a six-foot fence, <laughs> so when you come down to the corner of Brandon trying to turn on 65th, it's very difficult now. So if we're going to have a six-foot <laughs> fence on that corner, how are we going to see? we got kids on bicycles. He's going to have a car hauler come in and block the road <coughs> because there is no way of cutting off in, into his driveways. So we're gonna have car harbors blocking the road, which he did a month ago. <coughs> Blocked it for 25 minutes, or 20, 25 minutes. And there is all these cars going around, backed up everywhere. We have a post office on that road. We have bus stops on that <coughs> road, right there in front of his house. So we have all this traffic already. Now he's wanting to have a car hauler come in, drop off cars, pick up cars. He don't have no way of getting them, getting the car off the road to unload. It's got to block the traffic. That's my point of view. I go ahead. I don't want to see the warehouse. I don't. I don't like the idea of it there. And then he's also talking about redoing the home, bringing it back to life, mm -hmm. and then put a fence all the way around the property and hide it, hiding it. I don't, I don't understand why. The fence would be ugly there, if you ask me. And so would the barn. Okay. Thank you so much for your concerns. But you do realize the fence isn't part of this petition, nor is the warehouse. Right, right. Anybody else for or against the petition? Please state your name and your address. Sure. Hi, I'm Brad Kloppenstein, uh, president of the Greater Lawrence Chamber of Commerce. I live at 5674 Lawton Loop West Drive. 
at Fort Harrison. Um, I'm here to ask that you approve Mr. Miller's request and allow him to sell antique cars from his property on 65th Street. As you've heard, Mr. Miller's business, Significant Cars, is not adequately addressed by Indiana Code. Indiana Code refers to new car sales and used car sales. It does not refer to antique car sales. Mr. Miller is more of an art and an antique dealer. However, because what he is selling was once considered transportation, the state of Indiana forces him to register as a car dealer, which requires him to have a physical address for his business. I've known Sean Miller for approximately 10 years. I've known his business. I've known Mr. Miller to be of high standards of both himself and his business. What Mr. Miller is wanting to sell are collector's items that will bring affluent buyers to Lawrence. These people are typically well-to-do business owners who will spend money in Lawrence and possibly be the next big investors in Lawrence. The cars that Mr. Miller deals with are classics in every sense of the word. This is what he sells. These are automobiles that bring a sense of prestige to an area. Ironically, Mr. Miller's property is next to an antique store that proudly displays an antique car out front that is similar, if not newer, than the cars that he sells. His property is already zoned commercial, and if this zoning variance is not approved, there is nothing that prohibits him from selling the property to someone who may develop a strip mall, a liquor store, a bar, or even a check cashing business. I promise you that significant cars will be an asset to Lawrence, and I ask you to approve this request. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Anybody else for or against the petition? Oh, yeah. I'm still Rick Wells, and I'm still the councilman in District 2. Uh, Mr. Miller has an operation or a business that I'm probably on a member of the council probably more familiar with than any of the other ones because I have purchased plastic automobiles from an operation such as Mr. Miller's. Uh, I've bought a couple and uh, so company uh, uh, dealer out in Knightstown. There was one up on uh, 96th Street. There was one up in, I believe, up in Westfield uh, that uh, I frequented. But they all have one thing in common, uh, that if you take Mr. Miller at his petition, is all these dealers that I've looked at or I've talked to all have... Uh, operations of probably 40 to 60 maybe 70 automobiles for sale and yeah they're very high you know most of them are very high-end automobiles I mean it uh, um, they're worth a lot of money and but that's not really the point to the neighborhood you know as to what he's got in the building per se it's um, um, I guess um, uh, Council Musmaroff has mentioned and Mr. Crouch you'd mentioned uh, about the, uh, you know, we're only focusing on what's in front of us and not what's down the road. But I guess my question is, is I find it hard to understand in my experiences with these other dealers that I have dealt with and I have purchased from, how he can operate in such a small, um, in such a small space and only have just a handful of automobiles, you know, for, uh, you know, for, to sell, because these cars are terribly expensive. And, you know, the portfolio that you would have to have uh, for a bank or whatever, and I have no idea how his financing is or, or it's none of my business, but, you know, the more the better. And uh, like I said, I just don't understand how he's going to operate a business like this with just a handful of cars. And, uh, as he had said uh, to Council Musmaroff, is uh, that he's planning on a building like a 60 by 100. Well, I own a 50 by 105 down in uh, southern Indiana at my retirement home, and I've got it sitting on 10 acres, and it sits right in the middle of 10 acres. And the first thing everybody says when they come up and look at that building is, man, that's a big building. Well, it is a big building, and it's... Uh, and I went and looked at this property that uh, 
a gentleman wants to make this operation, and I, for the life of me, I don't know how he would put a building of that size and still keep the structures that he has. I mean, it would be such a white elephant for that neighborhood. Um, but uh, uh, like I said, I have questions, and I just don't quite really understand how he's going to do this uh, or how he's going to operate this business without this this big building. And uh, so I would ask, you know, him to definitely, you know, stay in operation or, or maybe try to find a better location for it. And uh, because I know the council, for the ones that I spoke to, um, which is pretty much most of them, are not in favor of this because, you know, they're seeing car lot. You know, that's what they're seeing. And I think I am probably the only one that doesn't really see, you know, the car lot. And uh, I mean, I, I see what it, the operation that he's doing, but I just don't see how practically he can do it in such a small area or such a small space. So I think that, uh, you know, I would ask the board to vote against this and then ask the gentleman to try to find himself a little better location for this. And uh, maybe even has the right zoning and, and definitely has the space that he needs. But thank you for your time. Thank you. Is there anybody else for or against the petition? We'll hear from the city of Lawrence. I always love these passionate debates. <laughs> and I appreciate the perspective that all parties are bringing the table. Council Rosenroff has an obligation to her constituents. She's passionate about the city. I'm passionate about the city from a different perspective, and unfortunately on this one, Council Rosenroff and I disagree. That doesn't mean I don't dearly respect her. I appreciate the fact that she has an opinion and constituency. I'd like you to turn to page four or the section four in the booklet that was headed to you. I'd like you to, even though it's not part of this petition, from what I'm feeling right now, I'm feeling everybody looking forward. I'd like you to look at the size of the proposed pole barn with porch. It's my understanding from discussions with the petitioner and the and the uh, his counselor it's his desire to make a proposed pole barn in line with the historic values of this and the appearance from the outside of the current property. I'd like you to recognize it and keep in mind that I build $150 million in structures a year when I'm not working for the city of Lawrence. This is a 50 by 100 property. That's 5,000 square feet. Anybody want to guess what the size of this room is? Almost exactly 50 by 100. So I think to characterize this as a warehouse, a large, huge warehouse, is a total mischaracterization of what is being planned by the petitioner. I can't address the fence question. I can't address how many employees. I can't address how much is the internet business. But when discussions occurred uh, with the city, the explanation was exactly as you heard from the petitioner tonight. I want to point out that I publish an economic development report of what we approve as a staff, what we intend to approve, what our intentions are every month. I think most of you received that report. I've not had one question from any counselor, any person in, that's received that report as to why I made this recommendation or was going to make this recommendation. I think it's extremely important to the city to expose itself continually to people of character and people with money people that can understand why Lawrence is such a great place. I believe that the few people that come to spend $150,000 or $200,000 for a classic car eggs and have dinner at the fort are exactly the kind of people we want to see Lawrence and how we're trying to change. Uh, I believe that this project is exactly what Lawrence needs, and I think it's an opportunity to locate a, a, past, a passionate, historic person that will add value to the neighborhood and not detract from the neighborhood. And that's my perspective from the city. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. Yes. So, I mean, it, it states plainly that the 
um, footprint of the proposed pole barn is 100 by 50. Correct. It does not indicate how high. And, and I understand that. I would suspect, and we should ask the petitioner not take my word for it, but I'm involved in these kind of projects pretty regularly. I would expect we're looking at an eave height of 14 feet. 14, this is about 12, to give you an idea. So that's pretty typical in a pole barn. And it's very easy to take that exterior and, and side it and make it look to the, uh, to the appropriate nature of the neighborhood. And by the way, if that would occur, it's got to come before this group and he's got to give you designs and you've got to approve it. Right. So he is taking a chance right now that if we choose that sometime down the road, you'll approve that. There's no guarantee to him that and I'm not making any commitment towards that. But what I am asking you to do is consider approving this petition as it is tonight that doesn't allow him to do any more than he's suggesting that he wants to do. And I think that's fair. And I think Maria, uh, I'm sorry, Councilor Rosenroff and everybody's expressions here are of concern are valid, but I think those are another day in court. Which is what I was getting ready to say. Um, he can't build the pole barn without it coming in front of us again and asking us to build it. So that can't happen. The fence, um, Brandon Street would not allow a six foot fence without a variance from us, nor would a sign, am I correct? The sign, depending on the size and location. If it's a small a sign point. that he is, as I understand the ordinance, we don't have any impact. Right, yeah. but signage. it's gonna be bigger yeah. than it would come in front of us. A lot of the stuff that's being talked about tonight, a lot of it will have to come in front of us what we need to look at is what he is asking for tonight. That is correct. Is a variance. He has to have 10 spaces, so he's got the garage and the, the two carports. Um, he's given us commitments. Tom has asked also for no repairs or banners or balloons and stuff like that. He's agreeable to that. Um, am I correct, Tom? So I, I need to make so, one more point, and then our city engineer would like to make a point. But the, the, the one thing I want to be sure everybody understands is the only reason the petitioner's in front of us tonight is the freakish law in the state of Indiana that he cannot sell a classic car and let it pass through here without an automobile dealer's license. And he's clearly not, there's nobody wants a fewer car lots right now as your economic development director than I do. And we're working towards creating standards up and down the pike to take care of that issue at another time. But I do not view this as a typical car dealer in any way, shape, or fashion. Sri Venegopal and City Engineer. I just want to address the question regarding you know, inspections. How do we make sure the commitments are met once it's approved? This board has been approving variances for a long time now, and there are commitments on almost every variances. So as DPW, as Part of Renee's task and part of our inspections ta inspector's task is to make sure once it's done, there's, there is no balloons there, there is no flying uh, people there. You know, the signs are up to the standards. You know, the lights are not shining towards neighbors if there's a commitment. So we do that occasionally, and you know, every once in a while, if we don't, I mean, we get a complaint that this is not working. At that time, we go back to the the petitioner or the applicant and make sure that it's being rectified. So we do make those kind of uh, checks occasionally. We do make sure the commitments are, that's part of our, our task in DPW is to make sure those commitments are not just recorded, but also uh, are happening. So with everything coming from Indianapolis to the city of Lawrence, we now have someone that is We've always had we always okay had, but okay because variances was always approved to BZ out uh, this mm -hmm. board so the commitments were recorded and it was our job to make sure that you know, Indianapolis didn't say have any say on the variances anyways so it was our commitment it was our commitment and we wanted to make sure that it was done right so we always enforce it and we made sure that it is done okay. does the board have any questions for the city of Lawrence Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear uh, back from the petitioner. Thank you. I'm going to spend just a couple minutes and I'll let Mr. Miller talk uh, more importantly probably to you and just talk about his operation. We sent out notices twice on this petition. 
I have received zero phone calls, zero emails, zero texts, zero anything. We had a neighbor meeting uh, at Councilor Rusmaroff's request. We had three households that showed up. Two, no problem. One, the folks that are three doors down. Uh, we talked to them, we walked through the plan of operation, we walked through all of these things. It was an open, fair discussion. People can choose to support or remonstrate. The point I want to make is that the constituency of Council Rusamaroff seems to be one family that lives three doors down in a property that zoned commercial itself that's located across the street from an HVAC operation that has service vans in and out every day. This will be 50 times less intense than that, and it's three doors down from them. We have, as we've shown, gone to the trouble to talk to our neighbors, Mr. Miller personally, explain it. He's got all his adjoining property owners in support of this, many other neighbors. So the fact is that the constituents, the neighbors, are really not against this petition in any way, shape, or form. I completely understand Councilor Rusamaro's perspective that, well, I'm not comfortable in the future. Well, the future in large part is controlled by this board. We just threw something out there because we didn't want to be accused of lying about it if we come back and have to come uh, back and see you again. We felt it was better to be transparent up front. If we have something that's too big, too tall, doesn't meet setbacks, and you don't like it and don't approve it, we can't do it. The existing conditions accommodate, other than the carport, which he has to have to meet his license application, accommodate the use for now just fine. Okay? And that he can do, if it was his personal collection, he could do it. It's not a traffic generator. It's not open to the public. It's appointment only operation. We put all of that in writing for you just to make sure that this wasn't something that could get become a runaway train. Your commitments also allow, even if the city of Lawrence didn't have its own independent inspection team, it allows folks by standard language within two ownerships or 660 feet to enforce the commitments. They can call the council or they can call the city to come out and inspect. There is no motivation for us to come, if he's dealing with quarter million dollar cars, to start violating stuff and have run the risk of having this board revoke his variance for non-compliance because that's what this board has uh, as its power. That would be crazy. So there are restraints that we're willing to put on in record. We'll add to the commitments, no repairs, no banners, nothing flashy, no lights. This is not what Councilor Rusmaroff or Councilor Wells ex think it's going to become. We have to come back to you to go anymore. We think that this use at its core is less intense than what can go there today without us coming before this board, whether it's feasible or marketable or not, there are businesses in C3 that could go in here. That would not be an ideal situation. This, you get the structure, the historic home, he's going to live there. You get the historic barn, and you have a quiet operation that's going to operate less intensely than a C3. I'll let Mr. Miller just speak to some of the operational issues that were raised. And thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you. Um, I don't know you, Mr. Wells. I think I've heard of you because you have some cars. We tend to hear about each other. Um, do you know who Donnie Gould is? Sorry? Do you know who Donnie Gould is? Okay. Well, he runs the biggest auction company in the state, uh, RM. And he came to my office one day, and he said, well, where's the cars, Sean? And I pointed to the computer, and I said, they're in there, Donnie. Nobody in the hobby understands what I do. I've been doing it for 20 years. Even my biggest competitors don't understand how I do what I do 
but I'm really good at it because I'm a good, honest salesman. I treat people the way I want to be treated, and I'm honest to a fault, and that's kind of hard to find in my line of work. Um, I'm a little insulted, to be real honest, for it to be insinuated that I'm going to get this stuff approved and then go about doing just the opposite. That is not who I am. I've been in business for many years. Um, I, I have an existing operation operating in a very tiny building, and I'm getting by. So, um, and as far as the warehouse, this is not going to be a warehouse. It's not going to overwhelm the property. Uh, I do plan on selling my house at Geist and moving here. My wife and I like this property a lot better than the one at Geist. So we, we bought the house at Geist for when our kids were in high school, and we don't they're gone now. We don't need the big house of Geist anymore. So we're looking forward to moving here. So I just want to assure you that this is not an intense use and it's not going to change the neighborhood in any manner. I doubt if anybody will even know it's there. Um, and I, I drive up and down Pendleton Pike multiple times every day. I'm fully aware of the counselor's position that we don't need another used car lot in Lawrence. Um, this is not a used car lot. This is very different. It doesn't operate like a used car lot. It doesn't look like a used car lot. Uh, please don't draw the line in the sand here. Thank you. Does the board have any qu questions for the petitioner or anything before we vote? Uh, actually, I do have one. Oh, sorry. The one thing that we haven't discussed, yeah. even if you have one car there, right. quarter of a million dollars, right. what kind of security do you plan for this? Uh, there will be um, cameras and alarms. You know, and lights? Not all you can and... do. No, I mean, there's already one security light in front of the Red Barn, one of those street light security lights that's been there forever, and, uh, and I have it turned on. Um, it's a nice neighborhood. I'm close with the people that are immediately adjacent to me, and they tend to look out for my property when I'm not there. Um, we've had very little problem. I've owned the place several years. It's not a high crime area. Uh, again, it's not going to be well marked. It's not, there isn't going to be some neon sign out front saying expensive cars are sitting on this property. Uh, it's going to be very discreet, so I, I don't anticipate. And as far as trucks, uh, the neighbor said I blocked. <coughs> I'm sorry, I didn't. Uh, I have a trailer that I haul a car in. So I have a pickup truck with a 28-foot trailer that I haul one car in when I go to shows. And I was taking my car to a show. I wasn't taking it to deliver it to sell it. I was taking it to a show. And I had to stop by the property briefly on my way, and I pulled off the road. I'm very cautious. It's a very valuable car. It means a lot to me. I've had it for 20 years. And I did not block traffic. I would never block traffic with my trailer with that car sitting in it. And I, I, I really, there won't be any semi-trucks coming to this property. Um, there won't be, I mean, these cars are delivered. They're not typically picked up and driven away. Um, so, you know. How many cars do you personally have right now of vintage cars? Do I personally own, um, what day is it? Okay. <laughs> you know, a lot. A lot. Okay. And where are they stored at right now? I have, I have a actual warehouse downtown. Okay. And that's where you store yeah, them? I'm not going to be getting rid of that warehouse. I need to get rid of some of the cars. Nobody needs <laughs> as many cars as I've got, but when you're a okay. collector, you tend to collect things. So. Okay. Any other questions at this time? No. Board ready to vote? Thank you. Thank you. Now, you are okay with the commitments. I mean, the commitments on tab number six, no repairs, no banners, no lights, and no electronical signs. Is sure. that what the board wants to vote? Okay. And no balloons, just for fun. <laughs> okay. And again. Um, were you frightened by balloons as a child? 
Huh? <laughs> I know. We're going to get bring Tom to Bloons next time. <laughs> I mean, as far as the lights go, I'm when I say no lights, I'm thinking of far of like a lot light. You know what I mean? Like an overhead light that would shine down if you were displaying a car, or if, even in a parking lot, you're going to have a pole light. I think when we faces. talk about lights, it's not going to be car light, car lot with lots of lights. Streaming from everywhere. Oh, you mean like display? But yeah, yeah. no, no, there isn't going to be any of that. But I, obviously, we need to have lighting around the building so you're not stumbling around in the dark. But other, I mean, just right. pedestrian walkway. I, I, we're concerned. Advertising lights. No, yeah. no advertising. I'm, and, I'm fine with that, yes. And as for the fence and the signs and the new structure, that all, depending upon the size of the fence and the size of the sign, has to come in front of us. And the building, the new structure would have to come in front of sure. us for a variance. So and, and I just want the board to know what we're looking at. Okay. And I'm not totally sold on the 50 by 100 with the porch. We haven't finished. Well, we're not, we're not talking yet. no more about the barn. Okay. We're, we're so, talking about the variance that's uh, in front of us. And the fence would step down towards the front of the property. It's not six feet all the way around the property. At this time, the board will be voting on 12024 East 65th Street, a variance of use of table 743-1 to allow a motor vehicle sale, which is not permitted, along with the commitments that are on file under tab six, along with the commitments we just talked about, no repairs, no banners, no lights, no electronic signs, no balloons. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Desmond, can you please give us your vote? Yay. Thank you. It's unanimous. The, grant, the petition has been granted. Thank you very much. Excuse me, ma'am. We're not going to do that. No. The board will be... Hearing new business of 21 LSE 094330 North Post Road, a special exception to allow a charter school within an SU1 district. Hello. Hi, good evening. Hi, good evening, Chairperson Lido and board members. Um, for the record, my name is Howard Stevenson. I'm an attorney with an office address located at 612 East Market Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46202. And I'm here to represent the petitioner, Promise Prep, Inc., in his petition for a special use um, variance um, to operate a charter school, um, a special use variance of the SU-1 district, pursuant to Article 3, Section 0326, the property is owned by Freedom Academy, Inc. It is a church. Um, they have owned the property since November of 2017, and they purchased that property from Lawrence Baptist Church. The property is located at 4330 North Post Road. And the current use of the property is um, as a church, and we are here um, for, to request to allow Promise Prep to utilize it as a charter school that has been approved by the City of Indianapolis and also the Indiana Charter School Board. Um, the need for the um, petition is that um, the use of the property can be permitted as a school um, if the church would be doing it itself um, for a religious school, but since they are leasing this property to on promise prep, we have the need, hence, for um, the special use request. And I believe we come with a favorable uh, recommendation from the staff as well. I'm here to answer any questions that you may have. Is the reset center in there? That's the reset center, yes. Okay. So the reset center is expanding out to... Actually, the reset center, that's the, the name of... That's their the name that they utilize, um, but it, it is also utilized um, for church purposes as well, and they have some other services that they provide, but it is for the Reset Center. Okay. That location. Okay. And the Reset Center has operated a before and after school program. Correct. Haven't they? Yes, they have. They're expanding then yes. a little bit. Yes. Okay. 
Yeah, no expansion of the building. So right. um, there was a question someone had, a neighbor asking, was there going to be construction regarding this trino school? No, there isn't. They're just utilizing the current facilities um, on the subject property. So you're only going to have kindergarten, first and second grade at this time. Correct. Hoping to expand to sixth grade, correct? Yes, it is. And the hope is uh, sequentially, you know, so each year they would possibly add an additional grade to cap at the sixth, sixth grade level. How many students is the anticipated? Yes, yeah, so they currently have um, 53 students, um, families who have uh, registered their, their students. So that's 53, approximately 30. Don't quote me. I did write that down, actually. Let me see if I can find that. That's pretty. 30 we have per... 31 students in kindergarten that are registered, um, 13 for first grade, and then nine for the second grade, for a total of 53. And then with the projected expansion, how is there a cap or estimate on the maximum number of students that the, the school would potentially have? Yes, there is. That was a part of their proposal. Um, you know, that may fluctuate in terms of, you know, each year in terms of what their expectations are. Um, but I believe that's approximately 250 from the K through six, you know, once they get to that maximum grade level. And then what would be the um, transportation expectations for students getting to and from the building? The, the school does not provide transportation for the students. The parents um, have that broad responsibility themselves to transport them to the school. On the plan of operation, it says under 2E, it says 75 students. 75 students? Yeah, that was the, in, in terms of 75 students for the K through 12, if you're saying, what, what section are you at? On? Um, clients and customers, two, and then E, do they come to the site? If so, when and how many? And yeah, I, I believe that's regarding the K through two. Um, this so that would be the initial operation. Yeah, <laughs> but currently they are, they have the 53 number, so they're below that number at this point. And your curriculum would be general studies? Yes. Board, have any other questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll hear from any remonstrators who are against the petition. None being, City of Lawrence. Be the shortest comment I've ever had in front of this group, Dan Zerner, <laughs> City of Lawrence Econo Department of Economic Development. Uh, we believe that anything to educate our children, provide our children a better background and quality of life is a good thing for Lawrence. Uh, we see no adverse impact and only good in this, and we recommend your approval. Thank you. Petitioner, you have anything to add? No, I do not. Okay, board ready to vote? Yes. We'll be voting on 21 LSE 094330 North Post Road, a special exception to allow a charter school within an SU1 district. Desmond, can I get your vote, please? Yay. You are unanimously approved. Board, now we'll hear 21 LSV 10, 5602 Cato Drive, a variance of development standard of the Marion County Sign Ordinance, Table 743-906-12G, to allow electronic variable message sign in an SU6 zone. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, my name is Kevin Sims. Um, Can't hear you. Oh, a little bit, sorry. Again, my name is Kevin Sims with Green Sign Company. Uh, I'm here representing the petitioner, Options Behavior. Um, we are wanting to um, remove the existing sign, um, which you know has some age to it, 
and replace it with a uh, new static electronic message center at the existing location. Um, I think we're compliant with everything besides it being a uh, Electronic Message Center, NNSU. You have to speak up, hon. <laughs> it's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. I can hear you out. In Closer? Is that good? That's better. That's Thank you. So um, we're asking for a variance for uh, uh, to allow uh, the EMC in a SU6 um, area. Did you get the commitments of what we have? I, I did, and I have shared them with them, and they are in agreement with all of what... Um, There's none? Okay. Yes. And I do have uh, a couple represent uh, represents from, from there here. Just wanted to let everyone know on the board that, I don't know how long has it been with these commitments? Since 2010. That any electronic message sign, it has gone up. These commitments have been on every one of those signs. Right. So everything can be consistent that not one's got one more than the other. These are the commitments that we give every um, sign, electronical sign that comes in here, and they've all said that they, that's what they will agree to. So I just wanna let you be aware of, this is nothing new, it's just something that we're being consistent throughout the whole city. So, okay. Anything else? Um, no, any questions? I, I would like to say that um, there's, you know, different brands of an electronic message center, and this is a Watchfire brand that we've used for 25 years, um, and it's uh, probably as well made as you can make it. Self dims, programmable. Um, everything you ask, I think it should comply with that. Yes, yeah, something I just. <laughs> driving down 56th Street and lighting up the whole 56th Street with electronic sign just doesn't go well with me. <laughs> it, uh, you know, I'd done a recent one in Shelbyville, right downtown Shelbyville, Indiana, and um, the quality of how we build it, and, and you can dim, we can dim this nits down to whatever uh, is needed, and that's what I like about the watch fire. It burns it to, you know, not, it's not 100% 24-7, like there, mm -hmm. it, there's, is some out there like that. It kind of puts a damper on, you know, ones that do what, you know, right. want them to do. And I do want to point out to the board that um, I met with Mr. Sims. The original sign was proposed to be almost 13 feet above what is allowed per zoning. And they agreed to bring the sign down. Now it's only going to be five feet bigger than what zoning allows. Which sign? The electronic variable message, the base. They reduced the base. It was a lot higher, mm -hmm. and we talked about it, and I told them it would be a lot more comfortable. The city would re recommending approval if they lowered that down so it wasn't so high up in the air and interfering with the signal that's right there at the intersection. So they were very cooperative in meeting all of the commitments that we asked for and modifying the sign to fit that intersection a little better. And I just want to point that out, too, seeing that he didn't bring it up. <laughs> Does the board have any questions at this time? Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody here for or against the petition? Okay. With there not being any, uh, City of Lawrence. Uh, Rene Kampala, city engineer. Um, I think Rene kind of brought up uh, the, 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 the negotiation we had with them about lowering the height of the sign. And like I said, this is, like she said, that we reviewed this petition quite in detail and it meets all the you know um, requirements that we set aside, set forth pre previously and the commitments are the same. So all the signs are gonna be similar that you see in city of Florence and uh, we to uh, request that you approve this petition. Thank you. Does the board have any um, questions for the city? Thank you. Petitioner, you can add anything you, if you want to add anything else. Okay. Board ready to vote? 
vote, we'll be voting on 21 LSV-10, 5602 Cato Drive, variance of development standard of the Marion County Selling Ordinance, table 744-906-12G, to allow an electronic variable message sign in a SU-6 zone. With the commitments that, um, of all electronical signs. Desmond, can we get your vote? Yay. Thank you. It has been approved unanimous. The board now will hear 21 LSV-11-11915 Pelham Pike, variance of development standard, the Marion County sign ordinance, table 744-906-12G to allow for electronic variable message billboard. Good evening. Good evening. For the record, my name is Dan Van Trees. I reside at 10035 Indian Lake Boulevard North. I, uh, I'm a resident of, of Lawrence. I graduated Lawrence North in 79. I've lived in Lawrence my entire life. Uh, I want to make a statement prior to uh, discussing the details of this variance application. In order to protect, I'm also the owner of Worth Outdoor, the petitioner. In order to protect Worth Outdoor's rights and create a su sufficient record of these proceedings, I would like to go on record as stating that I'm going through this variance hearing and process under protest. It's my belief and understanding due to recent federal court uh, decision regarding variance processes in the First Amendment cases, the process and standards being applied by billboards such as they are unconstitutional. Because I was not a party to these proceedings, I will testify as part of the record and only respond to questions the board may have as it relates specifically to my application. Bear with me, I'm reading this to get all my thoughts. Um, with that being said, the city, recommend, the city staff report uh, recommends seven restrictions that would uh, like this variance request to be subjected to if approved by this board. I will provide the board detailed responses to these seven proposed restrictions at the end of my testimony. Worth Outdoor would like to include these seven responses into the official record of this variance request. Prior to taking any questions specifically related to Worth Outdoors Variance application, I would like to point out a few inaccuracies in the city uh, staff report. The first one, the staff report states that the petitioner is requesting, requesting to legalize an existing billboard that was converted to electronic variable message sign known as EVMS in 2008. This billboard, this billboard is allowed, but the EMS conversion required the approval of the variance. That's what the staff report stated. Uh, the first one, first and foremost, this sign is not in a legal as implied by the city uh, staff report. This sign was not converted to digital in 2008 as the staff report states. This sign was legally built in 2008 as a static on-premise sign. As a static on, off-premise sign, uh, this sign obtained all necessary permits to be legally built in 2008 from Marion County Indiana Department of Transportation and the City of Lawrence. In 2015, one face of the legally built off-premise sign was converted from static face to a digital face. The lawful conversion 
of this sign was permitted by INDOT, Indiana Department of Transportation, and the City of Lawrence. I lost my place here. A permit was, was not sought from Marion County to convert this sign as Marion County was embroiled in f federal litigation regarding the constitutionally of their sign ordinance. In 2017, a federal judge ruled that Marion County's entire sign ordinance from, from 2015 and prior was wholly unconstitutional and unenforceable. Worth Outdoor obtained all necessary permits for the 2016 conversion. There has been, I want to state that there has been no judicial ruling that the 2015 conversion from the static digital uh, was illegal as the staff, as the staff report states. In fact, there have been two judicial rulings to date stating that Marion County lacked uh, permitting and enforcement authority during, this t during the time this sign was converted from static to digital. The staff report, the second one, <laughs> Staff report states that the city received numerous complaints over past several years about the billboard and how bright it is at night. The complaints were brought to the attention of Mr. Vantries and he failed to address the issue. It was only after the filing for the variance that he made the requested adjustment to dim the brightness. This statement, uh, in the staff report is, is fractionally untrue. Um, I met with Renee to go over the staff report to discuss this issue. And I stated uh, to her that I did indeed dim the overall brightness of the sign. I was a little confused. Uh, I indicated uh, to Renee that some of the brightness um, that was occurring was because we had white ads. From, from Meyer ran a bunch of white ads uh, on the sign. When you run a white ad on this sign, it's a lot brighter. Uh, I have brought Mike Mallon from Watchfire Digital, the manufacturer of the sign of the uh, sign that you guys just approved. Uh, they are the premier supplier of digital technolo technology, technology to the outdoor advertising industry. Mike will, will be responding to any questions that specifically relate to the, to the technology of the proposed sign. Lastly, the staff report continually refers to the proposed digital components as an EVMS, or electronic variable message sign. This is also factually untrue. EVM EVMS under Marion County Sign Code, which Lawrence uses as their sign ordinance, limits EVMS uh, to on-premise signs, such as the one that you just approved. Digital billboards are not part of the underlying EVMS requirements. Digital billboards are off-premise signs. and they are treated separately under the sign ordinance. They are also regulated by the state of Indiana through NDOT. EVMS signs are not regulated by NDOT. Applying EVMS restrictions to a digital billboard are overreaching and arbitrary. It is the peti petitioner's position that any restrictions specifically relating to EVMS are unlawful. However, I want to work with this board in order to approve this request. I've been operating this sign for approximately five years. 
if this variance application is approved by this board, I'm willing to voluntarily impose restrictions that are compliant with items two, three, and six in the staff report, and I indicated that to Renee when I met with her to go over the staff report. Okay, with that being said, let's talk about the variance request that sits before you right now. As stated, this sign was legally built in 2008 as a static sign. In 2015, one face of the sign was legally converted to digital by obtaining an INDOT permit, Indiana Department of Transportation permit, and a conversion permit from the City of Lawrence under Marion County's unconstitutional ordinance that was thrown out in its entirely by a federal judge. I'm standing before you today requesting this board's approval to convert, convert and update this billboard with current and modernized technology, digital technology. I would like to remove the legal converted digital face that was legally converted in 2015 from, from static to digital. I'm also requesting that the opposite side of the sign, which is currently static, to be converted from static to digital with current and modernized digital technology. That's it. That is, all the ver that is all this variance request is asking for. At this time, I would like to provide the board with Worst Out Outdoors detailed responses to staff's seven proposed restrictions. Ms. Slido, can I pass them out? Sure. These are something new that we don't have in our pet. What? Yes, um, see if you have them. Okay. okay. I have also included bullet points in this handout. It's very detailed. As I, st as I, as I have stated, the, pro the proposed restrictions that the staff have suggested are not consistent with the existing regulations for off-premise digital billboards. Once again, EM, EVMS signs and digital billboards are treated separately under the code. At this time, I'm happy to answer any questions specifically relating to this variance application. If there are no questions, I would like to take the op this opportunity to let Mike Mallon from Watchfire speak about the digital technology and and have uh, allowable time to answer any technical questions you may have. Board have any questions at this time? Okay. I'd like to have Mike Mallon come up and speak. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mike Mallon, business address 1015 Maple Street, Danville, Illinois. I'm here representing Watchfire. Uh, Watchfire is a manufacturer of digital signage uh, headquartered in Danville, Illinois. Uh, we currently have uh, over 60,000 digital signs deployed um, in almost every conceivable market, uh, both indoor and outdoor. Uh, I noticed you've got a LED digital sign inside the, uh, the vestibule here. So uh, we, we, we cover the full spectrum. Uh, the vast majority of our displays are outdoor roadside signs. Um, as Dan mentioned earlier, uh, there is a, a definite distinction. Uh, while physically, if you stood in front of one sign, uh, that they appear similar, we have different models that we sell for different applications. Uh, the applicant just prior to us uh, here for the digital sign, uh, I believe was, was proposing a small on-premise digital sign. 
Uh, those have a different set of features uh, than the proposed sign that uh, Mr. Van Trees uh, is, is inquiring on. Uh, our OA model signs uh, have specific dimming controls. They have controls on hold time, uh, transition effects. I actually have a, a, a sheet here, uh, which I can pass these out here. And it gives the uh, specifications for the OA product. Um, Long story short, uh, our, our digital signs go into uh, almost every type of application, uh, many of which are in, in communities, uh, in, on the interior of a community. Our goal is that our signs will be good looking, reliable, and they'll be good neighbors. So uh, with that being said, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Um, thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, does the board have any questions? It's a lot of material at one time to look at. Does the board have any questions at this time? No. I have a procedural question since Desmond isn't available to look at these oh, that's correct. additional documents. You can request a continuance if you want to give them the opportunity to see them. I mean, I would request a continuance, given that he can't see these okay. documents. Can I make a request the same continuance too? So because we haven't seen this. Yeah, I I have some questions myself. I mean, one, and I just asked Renee about whether or not we've ever done a billboard with electronic signs, and she says we have not. So I would be, I I would entertain a, a continuance to check into some of his concerns of, you know. Yeah, we have approved the billboard. We have, which one? Not for an EVMS. Oh, no, it was. Right, yeah, right, right. Approved billboards. We put billboards for four, that's correct, but not with the EMS. Yeah. Okay. So, I will enter the motion. Honor, so do, yes, the motion, there's there a second. And I'm sorry, board, I need to know if you want notice or not. Continuance with or without notice. It would, should be with notice with. that way. I just need to make it official. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor in um, continuing this to the next meeting, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Those opposed, nay. Okay. We have continued this until next meeting. Should I make one more statement? Is that okay? No. Okay. I just wanted to make another statement that Myself or Mike Mallon will be available for any questions. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. We'll hear our last case, which is 21 LSE 127650 Oak Landon Road, special exception to allow construction of an outdoor structure in an SU 1 district. <laughs> Pastor Wade Apel, uh, Pastor at Servants of Christ Lutheran Church, 7650 Oak Landon Road. Petitioner Bob Goodsman, I think just went to the bathroom. That's okay. <laughs> so, um, th that we are petitioning to uh, put a picnic shelter on the property. And um, it'll be for use for religious purposes, of course, but it'll also be use for um, the greater Lawrence community as well. Uh, from Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts to the AA group that meets at the church to uh, it'll be available for um, the homeowners associations. We have eight, I believe, right now that use our building on a regular basis to hold their HOA meetings um, annually. And, um, and so we would make it available for the greater community to be using the picnic shelter as uh, for building community. Is that the church on the corner or up the hill? We are up the hill. Up we are the next hill. To the okay. Station. Okay. And uh, we are here to answer any questions. Okay, let's see here. Sorry. It's for the church with the EMS sign, right? <laughs> yes, we do have an e We do. Uh, we have a watch fire sign, and uh, and uh, we have those same ordinances, uh, commitments. 
I found at the church when I arrived six years ago. So we, we stick with them. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so how, how big is this structure gonna be? I'm sorry. 1,900 square feet, I believe. Okay. Here he comes. And this would be built back of the property, right? Yes, the, it'll there's be, the parking lot, and then it'd be back. It'll be back. Um, it'll sit sit in between two playgrounds that are already existing okay. there. Um, it'll be approximately 60 to 65 feet away from the the property line with the neighborhood behind us. Okay. And I don't know a football field between us and the. Uh, the fire station so I'm, I'm Robert Goodsman and I'm the petitioner on behalf of <coughs> excuse me servants of Christ Lutheran Church uh -huh. um, and I reside I reside in Indianapolis and uh, um, and I guess you've already met Pastor Wade um, and I'm not sure I know what other questions you were asking in my absence but I'm um, more than happy between myself and Pastor Wade to, to uh, answer any questions a few years ago, it was interesting <clears throat> listening to the prior cases here because a couple of years, three or four years ago, we also applied to put our sign uh, as digital with some commitments to have it, I think we said orange on black. Yeah. Kept all of those commitments and don't plan on changing them. <laughs> and uh, we said- It works out really good, doesn't it? Huh? It works out really good, doesn't yeah, it? It does. <laughs> And we sent out about 150, between Pastor and I, 150 uh, notifications to all of the neighbors, and we haven't heard anything back. We have it posted out in front. And, uh, we're hoping that you'll approve it for us. Does the board have any questions at this time? I am looking at the site. It's way in the back. Mm -hmm. Our church is way in the back, kind of. Well, no. <laughs> it's up on the hill. <laughs> it's, up on a, yeah, it's up on a hill. Uh, that's true. Yeah, you can't see the picnic shelf. That was your argument for the sign. You nobody. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quite a ways. I'm trying to. It looks to me like the, the structure is well up the hill, if you will. You cannot see it from the road. You will not be able to see it because of both the church as well as the trees and behind the hill and the trees. And it's all going to be open except for down at the one end. Yeah, there's a, we're going to be building a enclosed shed, we call it, at the end to hold tables and chairs. Nice. Okay. Any other, any questions? Okay, thank you. Anybody here for or against the petition? We'll hear from the city of Lawrence. Uh, Madam Chair, Sri Venugopal and City Engineer. Uh, like I see, see from the staff report, we are in support of this, um, of this petition. Do you have any specific questions? Any questions? I don't have any other information to pass along. <laughs> it's a pretty straightforward, simple uh, request. <laughs> okay, no questions? Thank you. Petitioner, do you have anything else to add? Oh, the board will be voting on 21 LSE 12 7650 Oakland and Road, special exception to allow construction of an outdoor structure in an SU-1 district. Desmond? Yay. And the vote is unanimous. Thank you. Four. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Last thing of the night is rules of procedure manual update. Oh, Jesus. Renee, you want to give us? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. No, no. Oh, Renee knows. Renee uh, is a little bit more information about this update. Uh, the last board meeting, we came with a rules and manual update to add zoning, to rezoning to our original rules and, ma rules and procedures manual. But ever since we got uh, emails back from Marion County saying they were not going to process vacations, uh, plat, um, platting, and all that stuff, so we had to go back and add 
that information back to the rules and procedure manual, establish some fees for that. That's a major change in this uh, in this revision. We also have one, one other change, Rene. Uh, I think we had this change, right? We we have a change where there are two alternate members, uh, one appointed by the mayor and one appointed by the council. So that is another change that you will see in this rules and procedures manual. Correct. And that has been vetted between both our city legal and also council legal attorney. So they both agreed to that. Okay. So yeah, um, I was trying to figure out how that'll work. That when we come here, we have four members and no altern alternate here. Does the mayor hop up and appoint somebody from no, the I audience? Think, I think the mayor, I think the way I understand it works is the mayor will appoint an alternate member and the council will already has an alternate member. So if the council uh, board members are absent, the council alternate member will step in. And if the mayor's board appointees are absent, then the mayor alternate oh. member will step in. It's perfectly logical. Yeah. It's more logical than <laughs> Imagine. soliciting the audience. Logic. I, I did. I did make a phone call to Renee and say, well, since we're going to get these new new procedures, I think we need to be educated on what we're doing because this I is totally new to me and I'm sure to everyone else that I asked her if she could, we could have maybe some type of meeting either before our meeting or maybe another day if it would be feasible for. I actually found some really good literature oh. um, from the state on Board of Zoning Appeals members' responsibilities, and I was, I actually read through it today. I was going to share it with Sri. I think it would be very helpful to distribute to the board, so you should be looking for that to come in the next few days. Okay. It talks about how boards are set up, what your responsibilities as members are, and the liabilities that you could face if um, you don't follow these procedures. Okay. So it, it was very, very informative. Yeah, I think most of the board BCA responsibilities are very well laid out in the Indiana code, certain sections we can And this that. summarizes it. And, uh, okay, good. And like, that like I mentioned last time, the main, main change for more, for this rules and procedures manual is all the rezoning coming to us, BCA will provide a recommendation to the full council, and the council is the ultimate uh, authority to approve or deny that petition. Um, the council will have their own legal to review that, but um, on, on, on our stand, we will have a third party planner who will review the rezoning petition in detail, just like Indianapolis planners were doing. Um, and we don't, I mean, usually we don't get a lot of rezoning. We, I don't know how many we got last year, but ever since I've been a handful. in this. Handful. Yeah, not very many. Very, so where in the, in the event we get one, we'll, we already have an internal procedure, so we just have to, um, you know, um, so we'll have a planner, we'll send it to you, but you know, to them for review, just like Indianapolis did the review, and we'll have a recommendation from them. We'll internally review it, we'll give you the recommendation. If you approve or deny it, it'll go to full, uh, full council, and I'm, I think they might assign it to a con committee, I don't know that yet, uh, and then it'll go from there. Okay. I need to have a motion, a second for the uh, approval of the rules of procedure manual, the new updates. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? Okay. The rule, the procedure manual has Desmond been, oh, Desmond, we need your vote. Aye. Thank you. Okay. So the, uh, it's been unanimous that the procedure manual has been uh, approved. And at this time, the Lawrence Board of Zoning Appeals is adjourned.